I just want to say 110%, I am sorry. O Brasil tá chorando a sangue. As pessoas estão morrendo, realmente. Hello and welcome to the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. It was Brazil's golden opportunity. Years of preparation with billions of dollars spent culminating in a spectacular sporting event. And now the country is almost back to normal. It's new normal anyway. As the 2016 Olympic flame went out in Rio de Janeiro, its national problems fell back into the spotlight. The host country had a chaotic build-up to the Summer Games with President Dilma Rousseff on the verge of impeachments, an economy in survival mode, and public frustration at boiling point. But in many ways, Brazil surpassed expectations and disproved naysayers, pulling off a major spectacle, boasting new world records, historic wins, and little controversy. And that could have been the biggest win at the Summer Olympic Games. Its legacy, however, is still up for grabs. It was a moment of national elation. Rio de Janeiro, a tropical paradise of hedonism, tapped to throw one of the world's biggest parties. Among the 10 largest world economies, Brazil was the only country that had never hosted the Olympic Games. And in 2009, the announcement came at a high note. Brazil was in the middle of an unprecedented period of growth. 40 million people had joined the ranks of a new middle class. But on the outskirts of Rio, many of the country's poorest citizens weren't celebrating. I'm still very apprehensive because I don't know what's going to happen to me. But what I am sure of is my right to stay. Instead of an invitation to the festivities, some were served an eviction notice to make way for new infrastructure to accommodate the 10,000 athletes and hundreds of thousands of spectators who would descend on Rio. Some of those who refused to go were met by force. As police pacified some of the city's most violent favelas, rent shot up, and many residents could no longer afford to live in homes which had been built over generations. Now the Olympic rings, a perennial symbol of unity, mean something altogether different for those living in the shadows of the games. The 2016 Rio Olympic Games opened with a showcase of Brazil's rich color and culture. For many, the spectacle provided a welcome distraction from the nation's dark political and social predicament. From the time when the first plans were drawn up for the Games, Brazil had gone from one of the world's fastest growing economies to suffering its worst recession in more than 80 years. Earlier this year, inflation hit a 12-year high at more than 10%, and employment numbers are now in the double digits. The country is still reeling from a sprawling corruption scandal, and public confidence in elected officials has plummeted. Brazil's President Dilma Rousseff, who's being tried in a separate corruption case, is one step closer to impeachment. After so much tribulation, Brazil may be in for an inevitable national hangover. Rio's Olympic Games provided moments that will forever be suspended in time. The thrill of Usain Bolt's triple-triple, the Jamaican winning three events in three consecutive Olympic Games, the inspiration of Yusra Madrini representing the first Olympic refugee team, and the redemption of Brazil's national footballers who snatched a gold in penalties against Germany after they were trounced in the 2014 World Cup semifinals. Beyond the sport is the promise that the Games will ultimately improve the lives of the city's inhabitants, along with the national economy. Critics say it was nothing more than a party for the rich, one that rode roughshod over Rio's most vulnerable inhabitants. Many in the traditionally iconoclast city are skeptical of establishment interests and critical of power. But whichever narrative eventually prevails, Brazilians will have kept their reputation of knowing how to have a good time, whatever the circumstances. Randolph Noble, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Rio de Janeiro is Teresa Williamson. She's the executive director of Catalytic Communities. From uh, Portland, Oregon, we have Jules Boykoff, author of Power Games, A Political History of the Olympics. He's also a former professional football player. And from Michigan, we have a former U.S. ambassador to Brazil, Melvin Levitsky. He's a uh, professor of international policy and practice 
at the University of Michigan. All of you, thank you very much for joining us. Let me begin with you, Teresa Williamson. The Rio 2016 Organizing Committee President, Carlos Arthur Newsman, said, the games in Rio is a great challenge, but a challenge with success. I am proud of my country, my city, and my people. Rio has delivered history. And then we have the IOC President, Thomas Bach, saying these were the people's games, the most happy games ever. I take it you don't agree with those two gentlemen. Well, like you said in your introduction, uh, Rio knows how to throw a party. And uh, I never doubted Rio would pull off the games. Uh, we pull off huge celebrations every year, Carnival, uh, New Year's Eve, um, Formula One, Rock in Rio, uh, many different events over the years um, and constantly. Uh, unfortunately, that's a, 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 you know, it's a convenient, it's convenient to focus on that because the reality is very different on the ground. Um, you know, we've, again, 77,000 people have been removed from their homes in the lead up, um, but that's just become a figure to kind of reflect the lack of um, concern with the population at large. You know, school teachers aren't being paid, police officers aren't being paid, uh, sewage infrastructure that was promised wasn't built, um, uh, basic needs haven't been met. We have a uh, polluted bay, um, as everyone knows, and, and those legacy promises that would have had a real impact on the population weren't the ones that were delivered. Okay. Um, the legacies let, we've seen delivered sure. are let, let me, let me bring in Jules Boykoff benefit here. a small elite. Okay, let me bring in Jules. Jules, do you, do you believe that criticism is fair? Because there, there have been you know, changes. We saw a new subway line, some municipal projects, um, a, a new port. Is Teresa's criticism of the Olympics fair? It is absolutely fair. If averting catastrophe is our mark of success for the Olympic Games, then we're setting the bar far too low. And while you're pointing to a few positive developments, I think the best one is the development of the Linea Quattro line, the extension of the metro out past Hosinia, the largest favela in Rio, and out toward Baja. Yeah, that's, that's a positive, absolutely. Um, there are people in Rio who will tell you also that there are many other needs that could have been met by the Olympics, and that wasn't the prime number one transport thing that they wanted. But sure, there are a couple benefits. If we look back at the comments, though, of people like Carlos Nuzman and uh, Tomas Bach, they shouldn't surprise us. I mean, how often did they leave the Olympic bubble to check out the real Rio that Teresa is talking about? If you are content to stay inside the bubble, sort of Disneyland of Olympic glee, well then, yeah, you're going to come to the, those kind of findings. If you go out even a little bit outside of the Olympic bubble and talk to everyday people in the city of Rio, you're going to find very different answers, where nearly two and three people who were polled in Rio said that the Olympics would bring more harm than good, and that was at the end of the games here. So yeah, I think the criticisms that Teresa is raising, they're, they're very important to be talking about in the context of the success of the athletes. And let's not get it wrong, the athletes are the thing that make the games. I mean, you couldn't have scripted a better Hollywood ending for Neymar for that victory over Germany to win gold. And so it's really the athletes who provide the gold to the Olympics, but we need to look at the underbelly as well. Mm -hmm. And looking at that uh, underbelly, Ambassador Levitsky, what I'm hearing from both Jules and Teresa is that the Olympics were a success for one Brazil, but not perhaps the real Brazil. Do you agree with that? Well, I think, I think that's true. There's a certain amount of uh, pride, I think. Uh, perhaps in Rio, it's, uh, the negative part is exacerbated. I think around the country, there's some pride in Brazil. You know, there's always this sense, even before the World Cup games, that things are going down to the end, that's, that's not going to work out, and they do work out. The Brazilians have a way of, making, of putting it all together. Uh, the, que the, uh, the problems that have been discussed is, are certainly real problems. And let's remember, Brazil is in a real mess. It's a perfect storm of problems. They have an economic situation that has gone down partially because of the world situation. China, for example, is no longer uh, a big export market for them. Uh, the political situation is, as, you, as was mentioned in the beginning of the program, is in dire straits. You have, an, you have a president um, that will probably be thrown out permanently, Dilma Rousseff, who was elected by a large margin. Uh, you have a... Um, an acting president whose popularity is about as low as hers, almost in the 
single digits. You have a political system uh, where corruption seems to touch uh, virtually, for example, half the Congress. And so uh, that, legacy, that legacy remains. There, the Neymar kick certainly helps Brazilians. I was there uh, when they won the World Cup, and uh, it lifts national spirits. But that only lasts for a while. They have a terrific job to do before them, which is to really reform the political system, get some civic responsibility into the system, mm -hmm. uh, get politicians and others uh, working hard against what the problems are. There is a bright spot, if I might mention it just briefly. The bright spot is that we're beginning to uncover corruption and beginning to be more transparent in what is going on and what needs to be done. Teresa, so the ambassador brought up the divisive internal politics, the political mess that the country's in, the struggling economy. Uh, are, we, are we seeing a short-term high now, a 16-day high for the nation, and now the country is going to be back plunged into the day-to-day -day problems as a legacy of the political and economic situation? Is it back to reality for the country on the ground now, Teresa? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like carnival for, you know, those days everybody <clears throat> kind of can forget uh, what's going on at, at large and enjoy themselves and then get back to a reality. And uh, reality is that we don't have a democratically elected leader right now. The economy is in recession. And in the case of Rio in particular, um, we now have a huge debt uh, in terms of Olympics we're going to be paying off. We're probably not going to get a lot of works that we do need uh, in the near future because we're not going to have the public resources for it. And we have a municipal election um, a couple of months away uh, that's going to dictate a lot of what's going to happen in the future. And I think people are going to be turning to that. Ambassador, we saw some protests, uh, I mean, most notably for me, uh, towards the end of, of the Olympics, the Ethiopian runner. We saw little bits and pieces throughout uh, the Olympics. But are you surprised that the Rio Olympics weren't used as more of an international political platform for international political protests? Because we didn't see a whole lot of it, Ambassador. Well, I, my sense is that, um, you know, the Olympics are kind of aside from, ev from everything. Um, Brazilians have been, there have been a lot of protests in the streets. The Brazilians, uh, even the ones that are in dire straits, as I, as I mentioned, as Ms. Uh, Williamson, Ms. Williamson mentioned, um, have a kind of national pride in seeing things go forward. Uh, they're dissatisfied, but you saw most of the protests stopping. I don't think that was just <coughs> because the uh, police were out in force. They had 85,000 police there. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not surprised. Um, you know, I was asked before the Olympics and before the World Cup games by other media whether things were going to just fall apart. And I said, well, you know, they have a way. The Brazilians have a way, they call it jeito, of putting things together. So that part is, is very happy. But I would emphasize again the job that they have to do now. And I'm a person who really uh, loves Brazil is a major one. They have to reform their politics, they have to reform their economics, and they have to reform their sense of civic responsibility among politicians so that corruption is not the way of life. Interesting point that you make there. And I'll use this as an opportunity because you mentioned the media and, and you mentioned people asking you if things will be falling apart. We're going to pivot towards that in a moment or two. But before I do so, let me thank you, Teresa, and thank you, Ambassador Melvin uh, Levitsky, Teresa Williamson, and Ambassador Melvin Levitsky. Thank you very much, both of you, for joining us on the program. Jules, stay where you are. I want to pivot now and ask about the media, uh, media because media ask these questions. They, they ask, are things going to fall apart to the ambassador and to everybody else? Is the media to blame? Are we included in that, giving just these dire predictions about the state, not only of Rio de Janeiro, but of the entire country of Brazil in the build-up to these Olympics. Let's have a little watch. Rio 2016 was a nightmare before it even started. Amid all the pageantry, these Olympics are facing major problems. There was alarm over the Zika virus. And the big fear is that they're going to go home with more than souvenirs. This is already a pandemic. It's spreading very rapidly. And concern about sewage. They're now going to wear those antimicrobial suits to protect themselves from pollution. Of course, media scrutiny over Olympic preparation is nothing new. 
But was Brazil being set up to fail? Most of the predictions were quickly disproven. The Olympic Village was built and delivered on time, and athletes didn't contract Zika. But some things did go wrong. A bus transporting journalists came under attack. Hundreds of thousands of tickets were unsold. And one of the diving pools mysteriously turned green. Then came the story the media seemed to have been waiting for. Now to athletes on edge in Rio after Ryan Lochte and his teammates say they were robbed at gunpoint. New details emerging about what really happened. It confirmed fears that Rio hadn't tackled its crime problem, despite the army sweeping the slums and guarding Olympic venues. It soon turned out the American swimmers had lied about the robbery to cover up an act of vandalism. And some of the blame fell on the US-based channel NBC for failing to challenge their dubious tale. And then the guy pulled out his gun, he cocked it, put it to my forehead, and he said, get down, and I was like, I put my hands up, I was like, whatever. Matt and Hoda Ryan Lochte stood up to these guys. Honestly, that was a brave and dangerous thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no question about yeah. it. They tell you to do just the opposite. Yeah. For many Brazilians, the media's lack of skepticism said it all. The impression I had is they tried to tarnish our country, while we were trying to show that we have improved. Sadly, they wanted to paint a negative picture. By many accounts, Rio 2016 proved the doomsayers wrong, and organizers hailed it as a success. We can see in the media, in social media, what the sensation and feelings were that the people had. The page was turned on any doubts there were, and it turned into a collective joy of Brazilianness. But others warned that simply exceeding expectations is the wrong measure of triumph, and branding Rio 2016 a success distracts from the real problems in the country. There's concern now about how Brazil overspent by $1.6 billion, and whether efforts to combat crime will end with the games. Areas where the media may have reason to be critical. Sandra Gatman, The Newsmakers. And TRT World's Annalise Borges uh, joins the conversation now from Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Annalise, Zika, security, infrastructure, unready venues, dicey political situation. These were all mentioned in, in the build-up to the Olympics. Were we all partly or wholly to blame as well as global media for only focusing on those stories? Well, it has to be said that every time we're in the lead up to an Olympic event, to Olympic Games or to other big sports event, there are always reports or concerns about security or construction delays? Will stadiums be ready in time? Will other works be done? Will, will it be safe? And with Rio was uh, no different. In the lead up, we've seen a lot of alarming reports about the situation here in Brazil, about the situation in this country. And uh, par partially, those reports were partially justifiable because Rio is indeed a city well known, unfortunately, for high crime rates. Is a city well known for uh, construction works that never finish because of corruption involving big construction companies. It is also known for a lack of urbanization that has meant over the years that sanitation in certain parts of the city is similar to that of Europe in the 18th century. So, yes, expectations towards the Olympics were not very high. People were concerned, scared, apprehensive with what Rio would deliver. But as a, a, one of my favorite writers here in Brazil put it today, Rio is very good at the spectacular. It's just not very good at the everyday. Mm -hmm. And what it means is Rio uh, puts on a show for the world to see at least twice a year with a New Year, big party New Year's Eve in Copacabana, big fireworks display, and of course the carnival parades, which Rio is uh, well known for. But another problem is fixing everyday problems. And Rio, which is now waking up from a party, which the cariocas, the people here in Rio, have enjoyed, they know they will have now to clean up and pay the bills.
Right. Uh, Jules, was the media complicit in, in painting an, an overly negative picture or did it help keep Brazil honest and help contribute to uh, decent Olympic Games because they knew that the spotlight was on them? Well, the media certainly laid a few hyperbolic eggs, and I think one example of that is Zika, scaring up quite a bit of fear around the disease when a lot of people within the scientific community weren't nearly so concerned given the fact that the Olympics were happening in winter in Brazil as opposed to summer, even though they're the summer games. At the same time, I feel like the media did a decent job covering some of the key issues in the lead up to the games. I would say that with the issue of security, absolutely, everybody knows that's a problem in Rio. I lived there from August through December of 2015, and I was there for the Olympics, so I, I know the situation well. I feel like where the media could have perhaps done a little bit better on the security issue is covering in more detail how the outskirts of Rio were affected by having that 85,000 security force go into the middle of the Olympic venues and other areas right around the Olympic scene. After all, those Olympic venues, and I visited some of them in the last couple weeks, could have been some of the very safest spaces in all of Latin America. However, around the outside of Rio, we saw an actual spike in violence during the games. And those are the kind of things that it would have been interesting and fruitful, I think, and important for the media to cover during the Olympics. You mentioned in the lead up the Ryan Lochte mm -hmm. incident. And when I was talking to my friends in Brazil, they said, hey, if you can understand Ryan Lochte and our frustration with this guy who comes from the global north and treats our city like it's his own private spring break party <laughs> and feels like he can get away with everything, if you can understand Ryan Lochte, then you should also be able to understand how we feel about the International Olympic Committee, who does the same thing. And they come into your city, they treat it like it's theirs, and then they get in their private jets and they zip off to the next venue. And so I think there could have been more critical coverage around the International Olympic Committee as well. They deserve our serious scrutiny, not just because they're involved in straight up corruption, as we saw with a big higher up within the International Olympic Committee, a fellow named Patrick Hickey, who was quite dramatically snatched out of his hotel while wearing his bathrobe and thrown in jail in, in Rio, uh, not just because of that kind of corruption, but the wider kind of milieu right. in which the International Olympic Committee works, where you have corruption, uh, but it's just legalized corruption, and they call it everyday business yeah. practices. So those kind of things I think we could have seen more of at Rio Yeah, I, I want to pick up a little coverage. bit on, on the Ryan Lochte uh, situation. Annalise, from, from the Brazilian perspective, your Brazilian Annalise, as, as a South African, I'm well aware of skepticism from South Africans at people who like to use the high crime rate as an excuse to get away with all sorts of lies and fibs. I was robbed, I was, you know, all sorts of things happened to me when, when it did not. Uh, Lochte and friends telling fibs about, about getting robbed, um, what does that say about this clash of cultures, this clash of worlds, and perceptions that Brazilians have of these outsiders who come, as Jules says, uh, and, and treat the place as a, as a party place, tell lies and then, and then leave? Well, first of all, in terms of the International Olympic Committee coming here, using the city as their own, and then uh, taking off to the next venue, uh, that was already expected from them. Nobody here in Brazil was under the illusion that they would treat Rio de Janeiro differently or that the Olympics legacy would mean a whole lot for the poorest people in this country. Hundreds of family families were displaced in the lead-up to the game so that Olympic Stadia could be built and... Many of those families say that they did not receive comp compensation. There was a lot of controversy in the lead up to the Games. Uh, from the Brazilian perspective, regarding uh, that episode with uh, Ryan Lochte, I must say, Brazilians breathed a sigh of relief. For once, the problem was not them, was not Brazil, was not the high crime rates in Rio. It was just an immature athlete uh, trying to get the spotlight. And Brazilians were quite angry when Ryan Lochte released that statement saying that, insisting that he hadn't lied, that he was just, he should have been more candid in the way he described the events. Then Brazilians said, wait a minute, 
did it or did it happen to you or didn't and and people here got a bit frustrated at that sense because they felt that as they were being used the, the high crime rates uh, were being used to cover up uh, his own irresponsibility and yes that happens a lot here in Brazil Rio, in Rio de Janeiro is especially since this is a very uh, touristic place a lot of people from all over the world come here and sometimes they enjoy the party a little too much Yep. Jules, just enough time for a final question here. Moving on to Tokyo, um, you know, I asked at the very beginning, what is the legacy of the Rio Olympics? The lessons from Rio, in your opinion, Jules, are what? Well, I think one of the prime lessons is that we have a very new milieu in which we're thinking about the games. And we can thank the people of Rio de Janeiro for really ratcheting up the critical discussion that we see around the Olympics. It's absolutely necessary. The Olympics have essentially become a corporate franchise that you essentially buy with public money. And a lot of people raise those questions around the environment, false legacy promises, militarization, displacement of local peoples and high costs, that's going to move forward into what we're going to see in Tokyo. They have their own set of specific problems, serious bribery allegations on how they got the bid in the mm. first place. Plus, there's the sort of radioactive elephant in the room, the Fukushima Daiichi meltdown that uh, Japanese authorities say are under control. But in reality, there's a very different picture being painted by scientists on the ground there. So a whole set of new problems in addition to all the ones that we've been talking about today on this show as we move toward Tokyo mm. 2020. Okay, unfortunately, I've got a wrap. I've enjoyed this. Jules Boykoff and our own Annalise Borges, thank you very much for joining us. And of course, earlier, Teresa Williamson and Ambassador Melvin Levitsky. Thank you all. You've been watching this special edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. As always, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.